Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Catherine Robinson. Coming up, calls grow for the government to bring forward its plans to open up the international borders and restart life outside the COVID bubble. It's being called an abject failure. New evidence that just 4% of people with a disability in residential care have received a COVID jab. And what does the life and death of the man who invented the post-it note tell us about Australian life in 2021? And joining me on the panel, playwright and Indigenous Chair of the Creative Industries at the Queensland University of Technology, Wesley Enoch. Lovely to see you, Great Wesley. to see you. Director of government relations firms Chikorovsky and Associates and former New South Wales Liberal leader Kerry Chikorovsky. Always lovely to have you on the show, oh, Kerry. Lovely to be on with you, too. Yes, Thank and, and back in the studio. Back in the studio. And uh, joining us shortly from Melbourne, GP and former head of the Australian Medical Association, Dr Mukesh Heikawal, and in Canberra, CEO of the Disability Leadership Institute, Christina Ryan. Hello there, Christina. Hi Catherine, great to be here tonight. Great to have you on the show. And you can join us on Twitter using the hashtag The Drum and we're of course on Facebook. Well in the year before COVID hit, Australia welcomed 9.4 million international visitors who injected more than $60 billion into the economy. It's now been 15 months since Australia shut its international borders and according to Scott Morrison, it'll be at least a year before they open. The strategy is drawing criticism, including from within government ranks. But a news poll for The Australian found that 73% of voters support the Morrison government's mid 2022 timetable and that's just 21% of us would like to see them opened once all eligible Australians are vaccinated. It's this sentiment that Scott Morrison appears to be taking comfort from. And I think they understand the importance of a cautious approach uh, when it comes to maintaining our, our, our border arrangements. Now those border arrangements, it's not one day the borders are open, one day the borders are closed, that's not how it works. There's a, there's a sliding sort of scale here and we're working on the next steps. Now, it's not safe to take those next steps right now. Uh, it's not, and, but we'll keep working on what those next steps are. But medical experts, business leaders and politicians are becoming increasingly vocal and they're calling for a clearer pathway. Jane Holton is the chair of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and a government advisor on vaccines and hotel quarantine. She says we need to think differently about risk in the community. No one talks about eliminating flu. The only disease we've actually ever eliminated is smallpox and it took us years, decades actually. So I think the reality is this virus is going to be around for a long time, probably forever. And so we have to figure out how to live with it, not just in Australia, but around the world. So yes, there will be morbidity and there will be mortality from this virus and probably in Australia over the years to come. But what we need to figure out is how we get the best possible protection. And as I keep pointing out to people, it's two ways to get protected against this virus, get the disease or get vaccinated and we need everyone to be protected. So I'm on the record uh, as saying that I think we should have a risk-based approach. Uh, I think that we do need to differentiate exactly as we do now with countries like New Zealand, which is green, and actually Singapore, if they get this back under control, I think could be green as well. Now other countries will probably be amber and it might well depend on whether you've been vaccinated or not. And then of course there's some countries that are clearly going to be red. I'd be keen to see them open up as soon as we practically can and as soon as we believe it's safe to do so. I'd be hopeful that that would be in later this year. I certainly would be hopeful, but I do think planning now for a variety of options would be the prudent thing to do. I am a supporter of options to give people, particularly who've been fully vaccinated, alternative approaches to quarantine. They, by definition, ha have less risk of importing COVID, even if they were in some very rare instances carrying the COVID virus, their chance of transmitting it is significantly reduced. Home quarantine is used in the ACT, it's working very well and so I would support the extension of that approach, particularly for people who are fully vaccinated. So that was Jane Holton there. Some really uh, interesting ideas on opening up. Uh, Mikesh Heikerwell joins us now. Great to see you, Mikesh. I mean, Thanks. should we open up if we're all vaccinated from a medical perspective? Look, I think the vaccination is an important part of what we do and how we do it. 
uh, will make a big difference to how we can uh, re relax the borders. It's been the big promise, I guess, of going into the drive to get vaccinations happening. It's certainly what we see happening uh, around other parts of the world. Uh, I do think that we have to go cautiously. Um, I think that we, we actually don't know what's around the corner. Um, but if we've got people who are vaccinated, then we can have more laxity, especially within our own borders. I think one of the big problems we've got is, you know, you go to Sydney for a day and, and um, you have to go home and quarantine or in, 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 in hotels or whatever. It's, it's really very difficult to travel around the country. Then the international stuff becomes more difficult. And we're seeing the results of that as flights start resuming, in particular from India, but also from other parts of the world. And our front door that's actually keeping us safe is the, is the quarantine the immigration quarantine, uh, hotel quarantine, uh, what they're doing in Northern Territory. And I think that's really going to be getting that absolutely right um, and getting away from the complacency of not, you know, uh, signing in with the QR codes and so on. It's really important we keep learning the lessons we learned from last year. It was terrible last year, especially here in Victoria. We don't want to see that happen again. And we've got to make sure that we get people uh, in the right place, in the right space, vaccinated if they can. When we've got good herd immunity, um, then there's a much better chance of being more free to travel within the country. Um, and then getting the documentation uh, that people will be happy to accept overseas may allow us to travel overseas as well. Similarly, people coming in here into Australia from overseas, we need to make sure we've got the right source of documentation. What would you, scale, you, you should travel with a yellow WHO immunisation mm -hmm. book. I guess it'll be something like that, but mm -hmm. electronic, I guess. When would you say, though, would be the threshold for uh, immunisation across the country to open up the international borders? Look, I think that's, uh, that's an equation that the epidemiologists and the uh, very clever people working through that will, will give us. But uh, ultimately, we're nowhere near that right now. We're supposed to... Uh, be getting people vaccinated first dosing by December. We're going to have to work really hard to do it. I'm not saying it's impossible. We're going to have to work really hard, get everybody on board, both the people providing the vaccine, but actually getting the resistance that's there to vaccination uh, overcome. So people understand that, you know, the chance of getting COVID and dying is one in eight. Uh, and if you get vaccinated, uh, you actually eliminate disease. Or if you do get it, it's very mild. Uh, you certainly eliminate uh, many of the deaths that we're, get, we're getting and some of the ICU beds will not be needed. Mm. Uh, Kerry, from a political perspective, we know that Scott Morrison is getting a bit of heat from some backbenchers, mm -hmm. Dave Sharma, uh, Jason Falinski, Tim Wilson, to open up due to this significant economic cost that is mounting up. Uh, but a report today, as we mentioned in the introduction, has found that over 70% of Australians actually support border closures. Given the election timetable, it'll be held before May next year, who do you think Scott Morrison will be listening to and who should he be listening to? Well, I have to declare an interest. I'm one of the 30% or less who think we should be opening the borders. I've been saying that for some time now because I do think, you know, vaccination, mm -hmm. you know, the, the protocols we've got in place over, you know, most cases are working pretty well. So I, I declare my interest up front by mm -hmm. saying I would, I think we should, I'd like to think we could open them sooner rather than later. What those backbenchers will be hearing will be exactly what I'm hearing and I'm sure ministers are hearing and that's from the business community. And we know the problems with, for example, the hospitality and the tourism industry and the aviation industry. You started this um, by talking about the number of people coming into the country who bring all that money in as tourists and students and what have you, which is not there now. So all those industries are hurting. But what people I don't think are perhaps understanding, which has been a few conversations I've had recently, is that, for example, example, in the IT space, we cannot provide enough skilled IT people um, home from home at the moment. We've always been bringing those people in. Those numbers are not able to cope with, for example, the very clever startups that we've got going. And we've got a lot of innovation going on in IT. You can see it all, all the time. There's more and more innovation. So the people who are here who are qualified, they're doing very well because mm. they're able to charge a lot of money. But particularly with some of the people I work with startups, they can't afford to employ that expertise. The business people I know are telling because um, I've been at functions where the business people have said the same thing to ministers and backbenchers. We need to get particularly skilled immigration coming back in, but we also need, for example, all those backpackers who would be doing all those hospitality jobs, mm. picking all that fruit. We don't have those people. The economy is really reliant on them, and the sooner we get them back, the better. It's the balance, isn't it, between yeah. the health of our nation and the economy. Christina, there's that adage, obviously, your health is your wealth or our health is our wealth. 
Should we always prioritise that over economic concerns, given what we've just heard oh. from Kerry? Look, yes and no. Um, we're still in the middle of a raging pandemic, as Rakesh has said. You know, there's, let, let's just be really serious about looking at what's happening overseas and recognise that the rest of the world is nowhere near through this yet. They're still in the middle of it. So for us to think in terms of getting out there and doing stuff, um, you know, we are seriously putting ourselves at risk of creating that here in Australia. None of us want that. It's probably where that 73% figure comes from. We have been so lucky and it's because we've had a shut border. Now I get the economic side of things, you know, I run a business, I also have to have to be dealing with people and, and travel and I haven't travelled for a long time. But I'm not sure it should be over the, you know, the bodies of disabled people and old people. I think we need to be really careful about that and we're not there yet. We will get there um, if we can get this vaccine rollout strategy um, working better and if we can get some systems in place that, uh, that are more stable um, so that we're not having to constantly reinvent them, then perhaps we can start moving in that direction. But at the moment, it's looking just a little bit like the libertarians um, are the ones who think, oh, we shouldn't be closing anything, borders should have remained open throughout. You know, if, if we'd listened to them at the beginning, and they were still saying this at the beginning of all of this 15 months ago, where would we be now? Mm. So we, we really can't just race this one. We need to do it in a way that is sensible and we need to do it in a way that actually fits in with our vaccine rollout. Mm. Um, until we get that right, we're still in a situation where Australia is very lucky, but it's lucky for only one reason, and that's a closed border. Mm. Mikesh, it's interesting because we hear from authorities, not just here in Australia but around the world, that these decisions are driven by the health advice. You look at the UK, for example, they're lifting restrictions this, this week. They have more than 2,000 cases per day, but their decision to lift their restrictions is driven by health advice. We too are driven by health, health advice. So how, where's this kind of mismatch coming from? We're doing seemingly something quite different with very little cases, if, if hardly any, as opposed to when you compare it to the UK experience. Yeah, um, the, the UK experience is, is incredible because they did it so badly uh, and went when they came, you know, after their summer and then they had another wave. Um, and we saw terrible pictures from there before the ones from India now. Um, and they got on with vaccinating. They uh, brought out AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and actually, they, they said we were going to do 12 weeks apart, uh, which was at times frowned upon, but actually shown to be the right thing for two reasons. One is they got many first doses into people straight away, and we're doing the same. Um, and they found that at the 12 week mark, the r booster was actually better. Uh, and so uh, partly it was medical advice, but partly a political imperative to get as many shots into people's arms that drove that. Um, and then uh, because they've done that, the rates of uh, infection, the rates of hospitalization, the rates of death are now so low that they're saying we will no longer need to use AstraZeneca. Originally it was at the 30 age group, now they're going up to 40. Not because there's anything intrinsically wrong with the vaccine, it's because they've got enough dose in the country in choice and also because people there um, uh, are now much less likely to get infected because they've brought down that mm. pre-existing terrible rates of, mm. of vaccination of, of, of illness mm. and that's been a remarkable turnaround in a very short length of time. Mm. Uh, so Mikesh do you get the feeling though on that political imperative point that you just made there that our government is potentially curating uh, the decisions to suit this, econo uh, this uh, political time frame that we're working towards? I, I, I really don't think it's, it's, it's a case of that. I, I think that the circumstances have been really difficult. Um, lack of supply, the original blocking of, of, of doses from Europe, um, the retooling of factories in Europe, meaning they're having to uh, delay some of the, the doses coming to us. Then, I mean, there has been problems with rollout, especially in the aged care and disability sector. Um, and so they're things we've, we've got to make right. But, you know, in many ways, we are in a better place now because we've learned uh, government started to listen. We've got more doses coming to general practice. We've got more doses coming to hospital uh, um, state mass vaccines in New South mm -hmm. Wales and, mm -hmm. and Victoria. And we've also got uh, respiratory clinics doing some of this work. Uh, and we've got more doses coming. So all of a sudden, the tide is turning. Mm -hmm. But the tide that hasn't turned 
is people's resistance at the moment to vaccinations um, because uh, the, the quick question is, can we wait a bit longer? Mm -hmm. And the answer is there's no need to wait longer. We've actually got very good vaccines in hand. Um, and yes, there will be some coming of the other ones soon. And we might need them for boosters. We don't know at this stage. It's, it's a really difficult equation with mm -hmm. the new trains coming through. And we will be talking about that rollout in more detail um, a little bit later on the program. Wesley, I'd like to get uh, your view from, you know, the business perspective, the arts world, which relies heavily on people coming to the country to visit shows, etc. New South Wales Treasurer Dominic Perrottet wants the vaccine uh, targets to be linked to this reopening of borders to give business some sort of idea about a time frame and mm. some sort of security. I mean, is that a good place to start or what conversations would you like to be seen to be having to support business? Well, when I hear that figure about the 70 odd percent of people who are happy with the border shut, I hear a sense of fear out of that. They, they're scared of something. And I think in that world of fear, you need to make sure there's a story that they can connect to and say, this is why we need to do this. And a sense of reward too, to say, actually, if we get vaccinated, this is what we can do. This is what we can roll out. These people can come home. These people can visit their elderly parents overseas, that we do need this narrative of reward around what a vaccination can mean for our for our citizenry. I mean, I was talking to a, 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 an Uber driver just the other day and he was saying his great hesitation is, well, because he can, we can just wait, he said. I just want to wait and to see. And you go, well, what does that mean for us if you wait and whole lots of people wait to be vaccinated? What does it mean? What are we stopping ourselves from doing? And in the arts, it's been great. Like lots of people coming back to, to theatres, to, to, to cinemas and engaging in, in that work. But I think that it's because there's a sense of removing the fear and making sure there's certainty around mask wearing and all the safety mechanisms are in place so that you know that you can come and it's a safe place to be. Mm. And that, Kerry, that hesitancy plays out in many different areas. We mm. know that the Australian Open could potentially be one of the casualties of staying clean <laughs> shut here, might Although be moved to saying, Doha oh, yeah, <laughs> or Dubai. But, I mean, what are the risks there with respect to our international reputation of how we handle this? Well, I think, you know, it's interesting that we have yet to have an international group, a music group, I yeah. think, have come into the country. There's nothing been in since February last yeah, yeah, year. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, people are going to say, well, why would we bother touring Australia, really? Yeah. Because, you know, we can't get in and when we don't know whether the borders will be shut and, we, can't, we you know, whether we will be able to... We might go to Sydney, but then we mightn't be able to go to anywhere else. So I do think that's a huge problem for us as a, as a country and as a nation. And, look, I am not... A, I'm fully, absolutely cognizant of people's concerns about all of this. But, you know, I'm 65. I'm probably I'm much more at risk than you lovely young people on this panel. So um, give me that vaccination because, you know, once I've got that vaccination, I will feel confident about being out and about in the community. Mm, mm. If I do run into someone, to your point earlier, that if I do run into someone and I am fully vaccinated and I do get it, it will be a lot less. Mm. I mean, we've got, I think they had 5,000 intensive care, uh, sorry, respirators put into intensive care because that was the big fear at the beginning. Our health system was going to Not be overrun. Perfect. Once we get vaccinated, if everyone gets vaccinated, there will be some people who will get sick. We heard that from Jane. There will be some people who will get sick. But guess what? Our health system will be enormously able to cope. Mm. And so I think, you know, the idea that we're going to eliminate it is wrong. I think it's just never going to get eliminated. We have to work out what level of risk we're happy to live with as a community and in doing so balance to, you know, the points over here, the, yeah. the health of the community and the economics mm -hmm. of the community, they need to be balanced and I absolutely accept that. But at the moment, and I think what's worrying people is that the economic risks to the community are going on a lot longer than people thought they would. OK. I want to take us mm. overseas uh, now. And Israel is continuing its bombardment of Gaza City, launching a series of airstrikes over the weekend, including a deadly attack on Sunday in which 42 people were killed. Hamas has retaliated by directing thousands of rockets into Israel, many of which have been intercepted by the country's Iron Dome defence system. The death toll in Gaza now stands at 197, including 58 children. Ten Israelis, including two children, have been killed. Now, despite the bloodshed, a meeting of the United Nations Security Council failed to produce a statement of condemnation, with countries instead urging an immediate de-escalation. This latest round of violence only perpetuates the cycles of death, destruction and despair and pushes farther to the horizon any hopes of coexistence and peace. Fighting must stop. 
Wesley, you've seen uh, this play out um, for years now, but more recently the escalation over the couple of weeks. As uh, media operators, operators, it's so hard to cover this for a range of reason. For a range of reasons, the history there is so much at stake mm. for so many people. People are passionate, so passionate about this for obvious reasons. Is there an expectation, do you think, that this will come to some sort of resolution this time? Oh, well, look, we live in hope, don't we? But we haven't seen enough of uh, the steps forward and, and what kind of things can happen. There's this terrible memory I have of, you know, when these kind of situations have occurred over centuries, and that's what we're talking about, mm. They, they often end in terrible acts of genocide and things. That's unpalatable. We can't have that. So how are we moving towards a peace and how are we kind of, what are we going to look at compromising? And I, I see two sides that feel righteous and they feel that they cannot let go of, of the, the goals that they're trying to set. And I don't know. I feel real fear. I actually think about the diaspora community here in Australia as well and that they've got this sense of commitment to, to a peace there because they... they maybe want to go back, maybe they have almost a nostalgic view of what that place was and means to them and then how it's being torn apart. And I think that in Australia, it's very hard for us to understand the nuance of what's mm. going on. I mean, it's very hard for us to understand, you know, a First Nations perspective. Aboriginal Australia in this country, you know, like, mm. it's very hard for the whole population to understand a very nuanced 250-year um, history. Mm. For us to try to understand the Middle East, I, know, I think it needs real experts. And I, I don't know, I, I look at the death of the children in particular and, and the non-combatants. You know, you look at this and you, oh, my heart absolutely breaks. But this is again and again and again. Mm. How are we going to do this from the outside? Mm -hmm. How are we going to help make a difference? Speaking to your point about the diaspora here, Mikesh, I mean, do you have any ideas or any thoughts on how we can support Jewish and Arab mm. communities here in Australia who become entangled in this despite being so many kilometres, thousands of kilometres away? Well, obviously, as a diverse c country as ours with many, you say, diaspora from all uh, the region living with, with neighbours in, in peace, it's kind of a, a way of, of, of improving that knowledge and that um, acceptability of living with each other, which has to be, I suppose, uh, promulgated around the world. Uh, you know, this, I think there is hope. So um, I used to chair the World Medical Association, associations of all associations in, in, the, in the world would get together. But the people that led the way was the International Federation of Medical Students Association. Mm -hmm. So they actually had the best relations with the people who you'd never imagine um, being able to speak much too well together. Um, and I think that's uh, that's our, our way forward, using uh, our youth who are um, wanting to see the peace. I mean, I, I think about the situation in the Middle East. The whole of my life I've been watching this go by. People will remember listening to the wireless, it used to be called, and used to listen to short, uh, shortwave radio, and used to hear the Voice of America and BBC, and, you know, Kissinger would do his his trips to try and sort it. I thought we were getting much closer more recently, as has just been said, and I agree totally with that. And we have to live in hope because that there is there is the alternative is is unbearable to think about, mm. um, and people just have to get uh, to a place where they can uh, co-inhabit and 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 and, and co. Um, co-locate happily. And, and, um, that, and that cohabitation seems a lot further away now in these last two weeks. Christina, last Friday on the drum we had a journalist uh, correspondent from The Independent, uh, uh, Belle True, and, and she spoke about what was going on at the moment and, and she said that it's a, a war within a war um, and it's not just about a nation state bombing another. This is now about neighbour against neighbour. How do you come back as a community when it gets into that micro level? Look, this is it's it's horrible. Um, I think there's a there's a real need for us as a global community, as the human race, to be saying war isn't the answer. This is not going to help us. Um, where's it going? Like it it's it seems to be accelerating. It doesn't seem to be doing anything. It's not achieving anything. As you know the that sense of everybody's right. They all have, you know, they all insist that they're the ones who are right. And of, and of course, from their perspective, they are. So it is about pulling back. It's about stopping. Um, that's easy for me to say. Uh, I'm not a peace negotiator, thank goodness. But it, it's, it's, it's got to stop. Um, 
war and conflict are the biggest creator of disability on the planet. Mm. You know, we seem to forget that and we already have um, a population in the Palestinian territories. Um, you know, the disabled people there have a terrible life. It's very difficult. Um, the intermittent electricity and internet means that they are often um, really struggling to, to just survive. So this is not the answer. It isn't the answer to just keep hurling things at each other and killing their children. It, it will make everything worse. And, mm. you know, we're, we're just watching on. How, how is it that the global community is even thinking about taking sides in this. And there are countries that seem to be doing that. You know, one, one country that seems to think, oh, they'll back this, this one and another country backs the other side. And, uh, the global community needs to get real about this. Use the United Nations and start talking about this as a global community and saying, no, stop. We'll, we'll yeah. help you to move forward, but we're not going to do that while you're hurling things at each other mm. and wiping each other mm. out. Kerry, I'd like to get your uh, view on that, on the international community response. But before that, I know that you were a little girl in New York when I the Six-Day War I was. started. And you actually saw kids, Jewish kids and uh, Arab kids, just so fall apart. I was 11 years old mm. and um, I went to the UN school. And one day we were all happily playing in the playground as 11 year olds. And then the Six Day War started and kids who had been in class together for four or five years suddenly were at opposite sides of the playground. We're talking 11 year olds. Mm. So what, when we talk about we don't understand it, I think what we don't understand is the passion that both sides from the very earliest of ages are brought up with about you know, their, their passion for Israel, their passion um, as you know, Arabs as to the rights that they think the Israelis perhaps have taken away from them. We don't get that. We, but I'm telling you, as 11-year-old kids, the kids in my class, they, had, they got it, they understood it, mm. but we were standing there to the point earlier, you know, we were standing there looking at this going, what can we do? Mm. You know, when as 11-year-olds, all we could do was, okay, come on, time we went through the basketball around again and let's play together. Mm. But I can tell you, for the, six, the duration of the Six-Day War and then some time afterwards, those kids, some of whom had been best friends, didn't talk to each other. So this is something which is so ingrained from such an early age that I don't know how there's going to be a solution. And, you know, to the point everybody's been saying, we're not in peace negotiators. This is so complicated. Mm. And it is, it's generational. It's not just, you know, the last few years, mm. it's hundreds of years. Yeah, yeah. So, mm. so how, well, you know, since the, the, the creation of the State of Israel, it's become, you know, much more political, I suppose. But I don't know how it's going to be resolved because those passions in those people, they're so heartfelt and strongly held mm. that I'm not sure who's going to be the ultimate. Um, a person to be a, or group to of people it. to be able to solve mm. it. I just don't, mm. I don't know. I just honestly don't know. Mm. I don't think you're alone there in those no. thoughts. Well, I mean, there's been a lot of better brains than everyone with the greatest respect sitting <laughs> yeah. around this table yeah, yeah, yeah. who've tried and no one's managed yeah. to do it yet. Mm. Mm. That's right. Well, you are watching The Drum and with me on the panel are playwright and Indigenous Chair of the Creative Industries at the Queensland University of Technology, Wesley Enoch. Director of Government Relations Firm Chikorovsky and Associates and former New South Wales Liberal Leader Kerry Chikorovsky. In Melbourne, GP and the former head of the Australian Medical Association, Dr Mukesh Heikowal. And in Canberra, CEO of the Disability Leadership Institute, Christina Ryan. Well, plagued by supply issues, organisational challenges and changing medical advice, Australia's vaccine rollout has, up until now, been haphazard at best. But it seems things might finally be improving. This is the ABC's vaccine tracker, and you can see that the seven-day moving average of doses administered is at its highest point ever, at just over 62,000 a day. It's still we're short of where we need to be. At the current rate, the country adult population won't be completely vaccinated until January 2023. And what's more, many of our most vulnerable have still not received any protections. It's been revealed today that fewer than 5% of disabled people in residential care have received a vaccine. That's just 834 people in total. The Drums' Eliza Harvey has more. Oh, no. 
Residents in disability group homes were meant to be some of the first Australians to be vaccinated. But now, three months after the rollout began, the vast majority are still waiting and getting increasingly anxious. I asked my service provider for about three or four weeks, what's, what's going on with the rollout? And they're just like, we don't know, we don't know. We're, we're waiting for the government. I'm like, well, I, I want my vaccine. Like, so yeah, it's a, it's a complicated topic. Following the hearing of the Disability Royal Commission was convened in response to revelations last month about how few disabled people had been vaccinated. Today, the picture became clearer and more concerning. Only 999 of the 23,000 disabled people in group homes have been vaccinated. That's fewer than 5% of the group. 1,527 disability care workers have been vaccinated. Commissioners, based on the data alone, it may be open to you to find that the Australian government's rollout of vaccines to people with disability in residential care, and these are people who represent some of our most vulnerable members of the population, has been an abject failure. The inquiry revealed widespread confusion and frustrations amongst disability advocates. I guess the main issue is that it's just been incredibly slow. The Health Minister, Greg Hunt, says that's partly because aged care residents were vaccinated first. Now we're moving into the next phase with disability. There's the aged care, which was the highest vulnerability and risk group. And as that is being completed, now those teams are being redeployed into uh, disability in reach. The Minister says it's an appropriate response to the various challenges associated with the unfolding COVID crisis. Christina, some of the stats in there are, are quite revelatory, if you like. Only 834 people with a disability in residential care have been vaccinated. Only 127 of those have had two of the jabs. I mean, these are people in the highest priority. They're our most vulnerable, and yet they're still not vaccinated. How is that possible? Uh, it's possible because disabled people are really good at being forgotten by government. Mm. Um, we're, we're shut away, we're not visible. Um, during the pandemic, we've also had a whole bunch of people who are more in the 1B category, folks like me, who have been at home for most of the last 15 months. We're not getting out and about, we're still not travelling, we're not going to things, because we are in fact the people who will die from this. So until we're vaccinated, we are stuck and we become invisible and government forgets about us. It's not the first time they forgot about us at the beginning of everything last February, March, when we weren't even mentioned in the COVID plan for Australia. And we had to lobby very hard to actually get a plan in place at all. So it's very good of government to repeatedly forget about us. One of the things that they do is say that aged people are more at risk well, actually, not necessarily. Um, people with underlying conditions are more at risk, and that's disabled people as well. We are the people who get vaccinated for everything, you know, the, the flu, pneumonia, all of those things that we have to make sure that we have our shots every year and, and that they're always um, done on time. The other thing that's important to remember here is that those people living in residential care, but also the 1B people who have people coming in and out of their houses all the time to support mm. them, people with NDIS packages who live in their own houses, for example, have support people coming and going. So they've got people coming and going all the time from their living conditions. They have no control over those people. They have no control over how those people are coming in and out of their houses. We know that there are systems and, and mechanisms and, and regulations in place, but that doesn't mean they're being lived on the ground. Mm. So those people are at risk automatically. It is why support staff are required to have flu shots. It's as simple as that. Mm. It's so they don't bring disease into the houses and, and into people's per, you know, private dwellings. Mm. So those people are being left behind. It doesn't actually surprise me that we've only achieved a bit over 4%. What they didn't tell us in that story was also that it's a bit over 2% for the staff. Yeah. So yeah. less than half of that number of staff have been done. Mm. It's, it's not going to change anything. And, you know, we've just been talking about opening the borders. Until we get better with the vaccine rollout, we're not going to go anywhere. Before we finished 1A, we started vaccinating 1B. Before we've even got anywhere along in 1B, we started with 2A. Mm. So everyone, you know, the, the figures were we're monitoring the numbers of vaccinations that are, that are happening. Great. 
But there are actually 2A people getting vaccinated now. Mm. We still aren't getting to the 1A and 1B folk. You, it's, it's just classic. It's yeah. classic. Christina, it's, it's interesting. You outlined there very clearly about what the health implications of not being vaccinated as a person with a disability, of which there are 23,000 in this country. What are the social implications? There are 23,000 in residential care. Mm. There are 5 million disabled people in this country. We are the single largest minority on the planet and in this country. Mm. 5 million of us. Now, not all of those people are in 1A or 1B, but a lot of them are. So the implications are severe for the economy. If we need to shelter in place for another year, another two years of January 2023, you are joking. If we need to shelter in place for that long, we have a serious economic impact. It means we can't go to our workplaces. It means we can't travel for work. We are still in the economy doing those things. We might be relying on support, but we are also out there doing stuff and being employed in the public sector, the private sector, running our own businesses. Mm. So we are also being prevented from engaging. Mm. Mm. Kerry, on the point that Christina just made there regarding transparency, this mm -hmm. information has come out um, about the disability sector uh, after Brendan Murphy spoke, not at a national press conference, but at a COVID uh, committee hearing. Do you think there's an issue with transparency and honesty with the rollout? I think there's been a lot of questions which have been asked which probably be, have not been answered as clearly and as strongly as they needed to be. And I've got to say that I was shocked like everybody else when I heard those figures. I thought they were just appalling. Um, and I do think the government needs to be asked, you know, why is it taking so long to get into the disability sector? I mean, I heard some excuses, you know, because as we've heard, you know, we needed to get to age people beforehand because they were more at risk. Well, you know, Christina's made it perfectly clear that that's actually not true. Mm. So I think that, um, uh, you know, and I think overall, I think Greg Hunt's done a really good job. I think he's done a very good job with the, uh, most, of the most of the work in relation to the COVID, as have the state health ministers and the premiers and the prime minister. But on this particular one, I'm, you know, put up my hand, I say, I think they've dropped the ball. Mm. And what I'd like to hear, the question that needs to be asked now is, OK, what are you going to do about it mm. and how quickly are you going mm. to do that? Well, Mikesh, you're doing it daily. You're administering doses. Has, has the government uh, dropped the ball? We know that 3 million Australians have now been vaccinated because at the beginning, the program seemed to be very clear and well-defined and structured as to the rollout. But as we've just heard testimony from Christina, it seems that it's uh, not perhaps going as planned. Has it all gone out the window, that structure? Look, I don't think it's gone out the window, but uh, I, I love the passion with Christina was speaking. Uh, I work with Brain Injury Australia, and we see that with people living with a brain injury as, as another group that uh, in particular has, has the same sort of issues. Um, I think that, you know, um, we've got great advocates like yourself, Christina. Um, my colleague Don Henderson here in Melbourne does some great work with the sector, um, but they always get swept aside because there's not a loud enough voice, uh, and um, I think it's got to be better. We can do better than this. Um, aged care, as you said, hasn't been done, um, uh, and the answer is we've, we've got to make sure we are doing that. What has happened was, one, a included aged care people who were in nursing homes, but also their carers, um, and now they've pulled back the states and now doing the carers, which is fantastic. Um, they've realised they need to set, reset it, say to the states, let's do it. That's what we've got to do. We've got to be pragmatic. So, you know, Christina mentioned, I agree, that it seems a bit odd that you're doing the 1As. We didn't get to them. We started doing the 1Bs when general practice started doing some vac vaccinations. Uh, in, in our vaccinations in general practice, it was everybody who was 70, 80 or 90 or over, um, and those people with chronic dis diseases and disabilities and so on. Um, that was started to go quite well. Then we had the issue with um, a target looking at the, the statistics around AstraZeneca and saying we can't give that to people under 50. So all of a sudden, the bottom fell out of people who could be vaccinated mm. because many of, our older, you know, many of our disabled people, many of their carers, many of the aged care people in care, uh, caring for people in, in care, were under 50. Mm. So what we advocated quite strongly was please get everybody over 50 into the stream. Let's at least get that group done. No questions asked. Take away the bureaucracy because there's a lot of that, by the way. Well, um, let's get these people done. And so that was a great move ahead. And now we've got to say, how do we fill in the gaps? And we've seen the states uh, in New South Wales have started to do the 40s and under and trying to get Pfizer to them, even if they're not uh, from from um, 
uh, frontline workers. Uh, Victoria is starting to do that as well. And what it really means is let's redefine our goals. Let's make sure we get the vaccines out there um, and prioritise the vaccines uh, that we have there for the people, younger people who are at higher risk. And that's what's starting to happen. Um, and then we're going to get more of this outside of uh, state hospital hubs, hopefully. Um, and that will mean... I'd love Sorry. to just pick up on one of your points there, Mikesh, you know, about let's just get people done when we can. How much GP discretion is there? I mean, are they... If someone was to come to a GP and say, look, I'm not actually in 1A or 1B or even 2A, but I, I feel like I need it for A, B and C, how much discretion does the GP have? Uh, personally, and I'm, I'm not the, the one who rolls over every time the government tells me to do something, as you know, um, I would say my writing instructions are here because um, it's actually very defined and the rollout is defined. You know, I have a, a register of every single vial of vaccine I have, mm. and at the end of every week I have to account for every vial, mm. um, including losses and so on. Mm. Um, and the vaccine is immediately registered with the Australian Immunisation Register, uh, and so that gets, gets through uh, and is monitored. So I'm very wary of, of that. Um, I have a very low threshold for giving people vaccines with people with chronic diseases. Uh, again, my problem has now become that many people with diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis um, uh, are actually under 50. Mm. So it took away my ability to vaccinate them because I didn't have any other vaccine but AstraZeneca. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, I, I do feel that um, there's been some loosening. I think there's been some loosening up of uh, the rhetoric and the loosening up of vaccines to other places, and that's going to make a big difference. Mm. But it's got its own um, uh, intrinsic dangers with it because people are um, have this narrative, which I think is a false narrative, that AstraZeneca is not so good and everybody should go for Pfizer. That's not right. Um, and I think that uh, there is an important need to get everybody vaccinated, um, and we don't need to wait uh, especially in the 50s and over. Um, I'm not sure how things will be reset as we get more information about AstraZeneca, but in countries where it's worked, with you know, over 250 million doses internationally, um, it's actually been a, a great boon mm. to bringing down those, those mm. rates of infection. Yeah. Look, if we can have a, a look at uh, broadening it back out to how uh, the dis uh, people in the disability sector have been treated through all this, I I'd like to bring up a tweet uh, that Raphael Epstein tweeted earlier today. Uh, as you can see there, the Australian Olympic mm. Committee last week vaccinated over 1,000 athletes. Since February, Australia has in vaccinated 999 people who live in disability care, just 22,000 more to go. Wesley, what does this say about our priorities as a nation? Yeah, I, oh, I think Christina's point too, that, you know, thing, when people can be forgotten, they are forgotten. Let's say Aboriginal Australians are similarly too, that there's, at least in the community controlled health organisations, there's a lot of focus on that, and which has been great. But I think too that we, we sometimes like to be showy. We like to have the kind of, what's the outward facing story that we want to be able to tell, as opposed to sometimes the rigour of the uh, of the development of the decision. I mean, half the time, all I want is a plan. Mm. I just want to see the plan and know that it's going to change, but know that it's happening. And you know, to hear these figures around people with disability and the and their their carers not getting that kind of support, it actually goes well. We have to protect the most vulnerable in our community. And when we have our athletes who are incredibly healthy and strong, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be vaccinated, but I'm saying where are our priorities when that's the case, when that's what happens? Mm. And sure, Tokyo's just around the corner and is a gold medal, medal worth more than someone you know, living with a disability in their home. Mm. And I think that's out of whack. Mm. Uh, Christina, something it... that we're forgetting as well here is the, um, the methods that are being deployed. Um, these are disabled people who rely on people coming to them. And most of the mass vaccination yes. work is happening where you go to a vaccination centre mm. or you can get to your GP or somebody in that space. Mm. And so we aren't creating proper structures where disabled people have what they need coming to them. Mm. And until we get that one right, we're not going to fix this. It isn't going to happen. Mm. So it is about, you know, the logistics fundamentally. It's about rolling out the logistics around having enough vaccine to go, to be able to plan to go and to timetable it so that the, the disability residential care providers know that this week they've got all of their people being done, including their staff. Mm. 
rather than expecting. Um, in the ACT, the Health Minister put the call out last week to say if you can get to a vaccination centre, then please do. Mm. Um, we hear stories in New South Wales of people trying that but being knocked back because they live in disability care, they're supposed to actually wait for someone to come to them. Yeah. That's not going to happen. They could be waiting till Christmas. Mm -hmm. So it's actually about how we structure these systems. Governments are very good at expecting people to come to them and ask, but they're not so great at going to people to deliver. Mm. And they need to get much better at that. It's what we've seen right throughout this pandemic for disabled people is that government hasn't been coming to us. It's been expecting us to go to them. And frankly, not all of us have a capacity to be mm. doing that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. All right, well then, in everything that was happening last week, you may have missed the news on Friday that Spencer Silver, the inventor of the post-it note, died at the age of 80. His story is one of serendipitous discovery. He was a research chemist attempting to create an adhesive strong enough to use on aircraft. He failed, instead inventing an adhesive that could easily be peeled off, a solution to a problem that didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> the legacy of Spencer Silver's breakthrough is as much about post-it notes as it is about the idea of space. Having the space to think, to learn, make mistakes and uncover those happy accidents that are a hallmark of scientific discovery through the ages. And it's something our panellist, Wesley Enoch, has been contemplating as well. Writing in the conversation last week, he says that it's time to reinvest in the social capital of ideas and that big thinking has become unfashionable <laughs> in Australia. Too often we think the thing that makes us uncomfortable is wrong. I fear discomfort is no longer a spur to our curiosity to discover and explore new ideas. Instead, discomfort becomes a justification for the rejection of the new, the different and the other. The arts, universities, public broadcasting and the relationship with First Nations peoples are at the frontier of the new and the important big ideas we need to embrace and fund to build an Australia we can be proud of. Wesley, you say it's been unfashionable for too long to be thinking about big ideas. Why is that? Oh, look, I think that uh, especially things that are politically convenient, things that are often very short kind of runs, the electoral cycle, three to four years, that's all we need to focus on. When in fact, sometimes the bigger ideas need to be focused on for 10 to 20 years. We don't know what's going to come out of it. I, I work in the arts and the arts are all about big ideas and, and expressing kind of things that we don't know enough about yet, about creating a vocabulary for the future, for what shifts and changes can be. And often I've hoped that our political leaders have big ideas, and I think they do. When you talk to them, they're full of big ideas all the time. Mm. But they're sometimes being pushed out of this funnel, which is what is electorally um, palatable at the moment. What can win them an election? What can get to the next stage? And I'm finding, too, that a lot of... Um, a, a lot of funding, a lot of support is all about the instrumental value of ideas versus the the joy of just a big idea happening. How can we make this something that is uh, commercialised? How can we find a product that we can sell from this? Whereas like the 3M, you know, I love that story of here's failure that becomes a success. Mm. Actually, I just I watched something recently. We've I've always been taking one of those post-it notes from the bottom to the top. Mm. Apparently make them to the side so they don't curl in the wrong direction. Is that why they're curling? <laughs> That's why they curl. Yeah, they're, I find the rip-offs curl though yeah. sometimes, I think. But that, this idea of big ideas. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think that to take the time out, if anything, the great pause that COVID allowed us last year in all of the negativity, the positivity was take time out to think about mm. things. Mm. God, I, I came out ready for, to write three plays. I'm yeah. ready to go. <laughs> yeah, right. How many have you written? Uh, none. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to go there. So, you know, what do we miss out on as a nation when we don't um, have time to think and think critically about things? Well, I think we start to just skim the surface of things and we start to go, as I say, instrumental. We just go, oh, what can I get for this? Mm. As opposed to what's the joy of just actually even to, to sit in nature and to reflect on ideas as well. Um, everyone's about reading a good book and reading something that, that kind of stimulates them. But how many people take the idea, take the, the time out to reflect on the idea of the book, to focus and analyse what, what it might mean for their life? Mm. We just read it, consume it, 
go on to the next thing. <laughs> Why don't we take the time out? It's that idea, like, you kind of sometimes want your kids to know what it's like to be bored so they yeah. can think of things to do, isn't it? Agreed, it's that agreed. idea. And creativity at the centre yeah. of it. Yes. Uh, Kerry, you're of the view that we're not lacking in no. big ideas. No, I think, you know, we've still got some of the most creative people mm. in the world living in this country, and whether it's in the arts or, you know, as I said, a sector that I'm working with now, lots of very clever people in the IT mm. space mm. coming up with things. I mean, you know, we, you know, the Atlassian boys came from Australia, so I mean, there, you know, there's lots of really clever people around. But I would just like to make a comment about the political class, and I actually mm. blame the media for the lack of creativity mm. in the in the political class because. I mean, what used to happen would be people, when they were in opposition, they would come up with grand plans for all sorts of things, you know, whether it was infrastructure plans, whether it was new ways to deliver community services, all these sorts of things. And the idea would be you'd put them out there, you'd have a conversation about them, yeah. and what was good would be taken on board, what was bad would be rejected. But now what happens, if you put something down on paper, you know, what are we now? We're 2000 and... What are we? 2021. <laughs> Just trying to remember here. 2021. So if you put something down in 2010, and said, this was my grand plan. Yeah. And of course, you know, everyone went around and looked at it and rubbished it all. Mm. Well, when you came back to be wanting to put your hand up to go into government in 2021, they'd say, but you're that crazy person who had that mm. idea back mm. in 2010, mm. yeah, yeah. right? So well, I actually blame, I'm blaming you guys, because okay. you don't allow okay. politicians no, no. to be well, as creative and, as they And Labor got slapped be. around last election and having well, some big ideas too. Too many ideas was the, yes, was the call yeah. there. So we seem to be, we're so unforgiving of our mistakes. You know, in, in Spencer Silver's case, you know, that was the story that it worked. You know, it was, a, it was a, as you said before, a reward from a failure. Mm. So perhaps our politicians need the time to make a mistake and then grow from it. Yeah, well, and I don't disagree with that. But, I mean, if you, if you, you know, we've already been bagging out Greg Hunt because he didn't ro put, get the rollout out correctly. I mean, and, you know, fair enough. I think we can bag out Greg Hunt. That's, he's a politician. He's got broad shoulders. But, you know, I have actually argued on this program before that the reason we've done as well as we've done with the whole of the COVID crisis yeah. is that we have learnt from every mistake. We've actually learned how to do quarantine better. We've learned how to, you know, get the get the supply of vaccines better. We've actually learnt from those mistakes. But if you're a politician sitting anywhere in uh, any house in this country at the moment, I mean political house, mm -hmm. most of the time all you're getting is being bagged for get mm. for what you got wrong. You're yes. not getting the credit for what you've done. But I actually think they've learnt and they're learning and they're mm. doing it better. And as I said, I just bagged them about not getting the disability <laughs> stuff, but I'm hoping that they yeah. will learn from that. Because, yeah, we are really critical as a nation of anybody who makes a mistake. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah. let's go back to Lassian, though. I think here we've got the big ideas. How do we support them along the way? And do they have to run off overseas well, to do it? And how do we back them is and, the bigger idea, And let too. me say to you that I think one of the things which the government is finally, federal government is finally getting its head around is a manufacturing, an industry yes. and manufacturing yeah. And which in the budget we saw R&D incentives, totally. support, the patent box. Support those big ideas because, yep. you know, mm. we have plenty of people here. Absolutely. But let me say to you, the, the difficulty we have is that the attraction from places like Israel, which has been a, at the forefront mm. of IT development, like the United States for those people, and it's not just Silicon Valley, it's all sorts of other things. Mm. Our people are being courted all the time. Mm. So all power to the governments when they're mm. saying we're going to put money into mm. them to keep them in this country. Yeah. Qu Christina, do you think we're at a place... Um, where, you know, we look at some of the big ideas that have come and changed the way that perhaps we live our lives with, say, Medicare or the NDIS, for example, huge projects that took a lot of thought that somehow maybe some people do or don't take for granted, but they're there and they deliver us health care. Um, do you think we're in a position where now we're thinking big enough to create ideas like that again? I don't think we've ever lost it. I mean, you know, we are an incredibly innovative country. We're full of people who tinker in back sheds and, you know, the, the fact that we didn't invent the post-it note is, is possibly a miracle. We, <laughs> we probably should have. Um, I, I love Spencer. I love the post-it note. Um, the thing that's really interesting to me, uh, you know, I'm a leadership coach and what Wesley has said is, is spot on. We need think time. Mm. We need it to be legitimate. You know, we're filling our lives up with too much in our brains, too much, you know, if, we, if people are sitting there supposedly doing nothing for a period of time, they're criticised. We need to get out and sit under a tree and think. 
And then we need to support those people to implement so that they're not being lost to, to overseas, um, which is pretty much the history of, of really inventive people in this country is that they end up leaving it. Mm. Mm. We need to keep them here. We need to make it... Yeah, yeah. Um, we need to make it a legitimate occupation to be thinking, to be inventing, to be coming up with new ways of doing things and to be collaborating, to get excited by working together around big ideas, to chuck out mistakes, to learn from iteration, to get into, into making mistakes and learning from them and not being so down on ourselves about it. You know, we're, we're a very very big on success in Australia. If you don't yeah. succeed, there's something wrong with you. And if you don't succeed immediately the first time, well, there's something really wrong with you. Well, mm. the truth is we need to be able to make mistakes in comfort. We need to be able to share those, laugh about them, get on with it. And how many times did Spencer try it before he finally nailed it? Mm. It mm. took him a while. Mm. It's the apocryphal... We're just not doing Sorry. that. The think time isn't there. The yeah. space, the excitement around invention and innovation is... is pressured out as yeah. Kerry says it's you know it's not just the media I think it is actually broader than that I think it's our obsession with sport um, our obsession with winning at mm. all costs um, <laughs> we need to just realize that that's only a small proportion of the population yeah there's what? a chunk of success that comes over time over yeah. over creating over decades now Mikesh mm. is nodding because <laughs> that's a it's a profession where would you say Mikesh there is think time given to developing vaccines developing cures I mean is that rewarded in the sense that perhaps we're not seeing rewarded in other areas um, there is obviously a, a great research tradition uh, in Australia um, and uh, we've had great inventions uh, and breakthroughs that um, unfortunately don't, don't get developed because of lack of uh, capital uh, to take the next le level. They then lo leave our shores and come back at a more expensive cost. And I think that's part of what, what needs to be reviewed. I work with a group called the MedTech Actuator, which is probably the big um, one of the big hubs for uh, MedTech you know, um, startups to help them in that space. That's really important. In terms of collaborating, I love that. Um, I've been asked to go into a group in Melbourne called the Melbourne Academic Centre for Health, which is actually a bunch of research institutes and hospitals in our part of town all working together. And they also do that across the river with um, the other Monash partners in the other part of Melbourne and the Western Alliance, which is all the way across Victoria. So it means you, you're not just uh, at each other's throats all the time trying to get grants and so on, but you can actually stop and think. But I think that things like, I love the thing about the green dose, we have tried to push that, but it doesn't meet the funding model. You, know, you try and do something, it doesn't meet the funding yeah, model. Yeah, yeah. So you don't get anywhere, and that's, that's when you, you stumble across, you've got a great idea, and you just can't take it anywhere further. And, and the, but, sen you know, the sense of play yeah. that's possible, you know, we ask that of kids all the time, play and just be useful mm -hmm. and play. How do we keep that into our adult life mm -hmm. in, in a very serious way in terms of medicine and things? But this idea of how do we keep this joy of the ideas and playfulness and not be shut down by others because I think sometimes people are confronted by ideas that they didn't have or they didn't hear about. It might make them dis make discomforted them, make or them uncomfortable. uncomfortable. And so they go, that must be wrong because I didn't like it. Mm. And I have to, we have to get beyond, beyond that because I think especially social media has created this kind of algorithmic tribalism mm. that says, if if we all agree, then people who don't agree with, agree with us are wrong. Yeah, and we have to stop exactly that. Right. We have to stop it. Yeah, we we've all got to try and get out of our comfort zone sometimes, I think, but we're running out of time. Oh, okay. I'm all sorry. Right. I say, I we we, should, we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves because we send people to Singapore to teach them to be creative. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> all right, well, on that note, it is all we it's have true. time for. I'm afraid I'd like to thank our panel very much. Resley Enoch, Kerry Chikorovsky, Dr Mikesh, Heike Wall and Christina Ryan. Hope you all have an excellent evening. Ellen is back with you tomorrow. Good night.